Hello and welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on gaining insight from the world's best financial minds. I'm your host, Anne Berry, here to discuss the future of uranium and nuclear energy. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews that will help keep your portfolio on track. Today, we are joined by Stephen McBride, Chief Analyst at RiskHedge.com. Stephen, welcome live from Dublin. Great to have you on the show today. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Let's start, Stephen, by breaking down the hype around nuclear energy and the benefits that this alternative source provides to the world compared to peers. And, and, and let's really sort of go into this. Let's start by defining clean, Stephen. In what ways is nuclear energy considered clean compared to some of the traditional carbon-based energy sources such as oil and coal? Yeah, so if you just want to, you know, the classic way people measure is in CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions in tons. Um, just to take a step back for a minute, and I think people have this idea that you see the nuclear power plants and you see the smoke wafting out and they think, oh my mm -hmm. God, that's just that's just nuclear radiation melting out. It's actually as that that steam itself is as harmless as the steam comes out of your that comes out of your shower. Um, and you know when you look at the greenhouse gas emissions by nuclear power plants, it's lower than every other source of energy in the world, including solar, including wind, including geothermal. So. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a myth buster. A lot of people think nuclear is, is dangerous, harmful to the environment. Nothing could be further from the truth. Do you know, Stephen, I really want to get to the heart of that perception versus reality. And one question I have for you comes from the fact that you know, I'm British and there, there was at a point in time a leak uh, coming out of a nuclear energy plant. This was a long time ago. We saw what happened in Japan after the tsunami. So there is a perception that when it's catastrophic and it involves nuclear, right, then the downside is so much worse in those moments versus other sources. Again, that I'm just relaying what the perception is. Fact check me on this. Is, is this somehow related to reality or is it all just perception? So I think people's, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you an interesting one. I'm sure you know Peter Thiel's question, what do you believe that the rest of the world disagrees with you with? And I have a, I have a controversial one. I think they need, the world, we need more nuclear meltdowns. Let me explain that. When, when, the three, <laughs> when the Three Mile Island accident happened in 1979, there was basically no radiation that leaked out. No people were, were, were harmed. No people died as a result. In Fukushima, when that disaster happened, um, a lot of people actually rushed to the nuclear power plant uh, for safety from the tsunami. Um, I think people's perception of this, that nuclear is dangerous, is rightly anchored to Chernobyl, which was a complete disaster, okay? Mm -hmm. And it did leak radiation out all over the world, and it did kill millions of people and made, more, uh, ma made many more millions sick. The thing is that um, the nuclear power plants of today, or even the ones built 30 years ago, are so incredibly safe, okay, mm -hmm. that even if you de do get a nuclear meltdown, like 1979, Three Mile Island, um, the amount of toxic fuel that, that leaks out is incredibly, incredibly small. And of course, this is all relative, right? When you, when you think about that toxic fuel and how many people it, it harms, you also have to compare it to how many people are harmed by coal or oil or even natural gas or solar and wind for that matter. Yeah, um, and yeah. w when you do that, you look at the deaths caused by these accidents. Um, nuclear is actually proven to be safer than any other source of energy uh, in the world. So just deaths per, per uh, terawatt hours. Nuclear, nuclear bottom of the list. That's if anyone wants to check, it's from the Our World and Data, which has incredible data on energy. So, so well, Stephen, first of all, that's fascinating to really help um, address some of those those sort of inherent fears. Safety, therefore, being one element of this, that you would advocate for why nuclear would be the alternative energy source of choice. How also does energy stack up compared to two of those clean energy sources you reference, which are solar and wind? What are the comparative benefits? Yeah, so um, when you think about, we all want our computers to work all the time, right? And our fridges to stay on and uh, just for us to be able to plug something into the wall and it to be work 24 seven. 
I'm a, I'm bullish on, on solar, solar and wind. I think they're incredible technologies. They have obviously come way down the cost curve. The thing they are lacking on is that they are not base load power. They are not on 24 seven. When right. the sun does not shine, solar power does not work. When the wind does not blow, the, the wind turbines do not produce energy. Um, the uptime, just, just think about the, the amount of time a nuclear power plant is running. I think it's 99.7%. Okay. And that's mm. in most countries, it's 25% for, for solar. So I mean, your solar panel is only producing uh, power around six hours of a day. Wind is around 35%, so eight hours a day. That makes a that makes a huge difference because obviously we we want our we want our, our, our plug sockets to work all the time. So you really need that base load power unless you're willing to deal with blackouts all the time. Which uh, I, I recently suffered a blackout, and I can tell you they are incredibly incredibly inconvenient. The other thing, Anne, is that the cost. So right now, nuclear is is costly. Um, because there's you know there's a lot of regulatory uh, red tape around it, rightly so. I mean, you don't just want anyone going building a nuclear power plant. But I think the thing people miss with solar and wind is that I'm sure you may be seeing the le- low levelized cost of energy or localized cost of energy stats saying solar and wind are among the cheapest forms of energy. A lot of those stats, unfortunately, do not take into account the fact that solar and wind do not work all the time. And what happens then? You need to run a whole backup grid, a gas-fired power peaking plant, to support that uh, intermittent energy. So that is it. A few minutes, Stephen, because I just want to, you know, I just want to just push on this idea of the relative um, efficiency or efficacy and that runtime of solar and wind now versus what it could be as those energy sources scale and where there is perhaps more supply and even some redundancy over time, that would be maybe a long time down the road with a lot of investment. This is very capital intensive, but just because it's not getting the base loads you're referring to today, doesn't necessarily mean that it can't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think ba- batteries are a big, big part of this. Um, but I would say you want your grid, you want your energy grid to be like a, a rugby team, right? <laughs> you want different different guys in there doing different jobs. You want the big fat guys and you want the small fast guys, right? Um, and that's why I think uh, an ideal energy grid would have a, uh, a cheap, abundant base load power at the bottom, nuclear maybe. Nuclear, it's certainly, um, it's certainly better than coal and oil. And then on top of that, you can have solar and wind. And I think you, you know where maybe we've gone wrong in the last couple of years is that we say, hey, everything is gonna be solar and wind. And when you look at the, you know, just, just look at people's energy bills where solar and wind are a, a, a big part of the grid. They're generally higher cost. And, you know, in Texas, Texas is the, is the, the clean energy capital of America suffering huge blackouts. So you, again, just, just a little in the weeds thing here, an energy grid needs, when you have an energy grid, the supply and demand needs to be perfectly balanced 100% of the time or you get blackouts. So I would say all of these things need to be factored in when we're going gung-ho into solar and wind. Well, let's just dig into a little bit, Stephen. You've made a number of different arguments now, ranging from safety to efficiency to reliability, advocating for nuclear energy. And there are some extremely visible, extremely well-known advocates for nuclear. Bill Gates springs to mind, right? I read his book and he's talked at length and for a long time now about the relative benefits of nuclear energy. So what exactly is it that has prevented the US and other countries from adopting nuclear energy more than they have done to date? And it really is the fear over nuclear meltdowns, unfortunately. And I think, again, when you look at the data, the data just lines up and said it's the, it's the cleanest, safest form of energy. Unfortunately, there's a lot of nimbyism. I actually remember when I was in school here, Ireland, uh, in Ireland, they got every school aged child to send a postcard to Tony Blair to shut down Sellafield, which which I'm sure you're aware of in the UK, because Sellafield was quote, quite close to Ireland. And um, there were stories about it, it causing cancer and all this stuff. Just not the case. So unfortunately, this is a case where, you know, we often say the best technology doesn't win. This is a case where the best technology did not win. And there's been, you know, I would encourage people to watch Oliver Stone's great documentary, I think Nuclear Now. Um, 
this is, yeah, unfortunately, they just haven't looked at the data. There's a lot of nimbyism. I don't want the nuclear power plant in my back garden, uh, mm-hmm. people say, but I, I am hopeful we're turning a corner on that. Stephen, can you just give us a couple of numbers to help us really understand the different levels of adoption that we've seen? So which country springs to your mind as having embraced nuclear energy the most? And for that country, roughly what proportion of its energy needs are fulfilled with nuclear? And then by comparison, roughly what part of the U.S. is? Help us understand that spectrum of outcomes. The one that really stands out, Anne, is France. I think currently 75% of its if it's, uh, electricity comes from nuclear power plants. That mm-hmm. is the one country that's kind of said, you know what, guys, we're going to embrace this. We think it's the right path. And France has among the cheapest energy costs when you exclude taxes in Europe. Um, so that's 75%. In America, nuclear power plants currently keep the lights on for one in five American homes. It's roughly 20% today. Um, and th- that, that could have been so much more. But um, I, I'm, I think we're on the cusp of a nuclear renaissance, which is, is promising. Stephen, I want to, to, to touch on politics and how that may impact or not the adoption of nuclear. If you look at the US, you know, I'd love your perspective on whether one of the reasons there hasn't been more nuclear adoption has been um, the influence of the oil and gas industry and its ability to lobby to influence certain outcomes. And then also, let's just go back to your European example, right? You talked about France and 75% of its energy coming from nuclear. If you look at Germany, by contrast, and you saw the impact of when um, gas lines, when Gazprom, right, was able to, you know, shut off um, certain supply. Talk to us a little bit about how these geopolitical or domestic political considerations are impacting nuclear adoption. So I think this is one of the big catalysts right now, the geopolitical concerns. But I just want to um, address your first question, you know, first of all. So, yes, I mean, in the 1970s, there was an ad campaign, I think, by the Rockefeller Foundation that essentially came out and said, you know, nuclear is bad. And they conflated nuclear bombs with nuclear power, unfortunately. And that's what really did push the public perception um, against nuclear, unfortunately, and you think about, we often talk about how dangerous nuclear is. I like to flip that on its head and say, how many lives have been lost because we did not fully embrace nuclear power and have cheap, clean, abundant energy? And how many technologies were not invented because we, we, we did not have that? You know, it's, it's interesting to look at the 70s. The <laughs> right. It, it's yeah, it's unfortunate. But I think, you know, talking about the geopolitical concerns, this is really a big thing right now, right? Germany um, turned away. I, I think it closed off its last nuclear power plant last December, so mm-hmm. roughly a year ago. Um, obviously, electricity costs in Germany have gone sky high. They are incredibly reliable on Russian uh, fossil fuels to do so. Um, and <laughs> you look at you look at France, right? France France has fully embraced it, and it doesn't have. Uh, as nearly uh, as many concerns uh, as that. And the funny thing is Germany actually imports some of its electricity from France. It's kind of like, you know, th- nuclear, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, they think as soon as, you know, if it's over the board or it's magically not a problem or something like that. But um, yeah, I think this is one of the big things you're seeing um, America is touring this way as well, right? Because, you know, America is energy independent right now, but I think they realize that, um, hey, if we could have, if we could double the number of reactors, we can cut off all these geopolitical concerns um, that we have. So incredible catalyst for, for nuclear energy. Well, let's talk about what's been going on in terms of American investment in the space, Stephen. Um, under the auspices, not of, of geopolitics, at least not ostensibly, but in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act. So the, the Biden administration, uh, through the IRA, has earmarked $30 billion to go to the nuclear energy sector in America. Talk to us a little bit around what specifically that 30 billion is intended to do and create in the nuclear energy sector? Yeah, so as far as I understand, it's it's meant to go towards helping old power plants restart and then uh, into small modular reactors, micro reactors. You know, we think of uh, power plants as these big, huge things that take 20 or 30 years to build. Their next uh, version of, of nuclear energy is these small modular reactors, right? Um, even micro reactors that you can, you know, Microsoft came out and said, you know what, we're spending 
an ordinate amount of money on, on, on energy. We want to build our own micronuclear reactors to power our data centers. So I think this really, mar- this really earmarks a huge change from the U.S. government because for 30 or 40 years, really, um, it has kind of ignored nuclear power, right? It's kind of pushed it to the wayside and said, this is not what we want to do. This is the first time, as as I understand it, that they've actually handed money to the nuclear sector. Um, not only did we get the first ever plant restart um, in Michigan, for, which was helped by that money, we also get the, America's first new nuclear reactor in over 30 years in Georgia. So, yeah, there, there's definitely a sea change underway. I think the facts are now you know, people are starting to, to understand the facts more uh, thanks to the Internet, thanks to all these things. So, uh, yeah, it's certainly a sea change. Stephen, let's let's try to delineate what you've called a sea change, maybe at the federal level. But let's talk about what's going on at the state level. If you take a state like California, for example, historically, it has been resistant um, to embracing nuclear energy and has closed all of the state's plants. I believe, uh, except for one. So although you've got a federal program that seems to be supporting the industry, talk us through how state law comes into play in either limiting or enhancing it. Of course, the great thing about America, Anne, is that the states get to decide, right, what goes on. I think it was interesting what happened in Diablo Canyon, simply for the reason that that plant was slated to close. And Gavin Newsom came out and he said, hey, if we close this plant, you're going to have statewide blackouts. And they signed a deal to keep it open for a couple of other years. I think whether it's California in America or some of the Nordic states or, or even a lot of the European countries, you're starting to see, actually, Europe just, just mandated nuclear now is now part of ESG. You are starting to see the clean energy folks, the ESG folks, really embrace nuclear for the first time ever. They've, they've spent 50 years, Greenpeace and the UN and all these guys fighting nuclear power. You're starting to see them realize that there is no way they can hit their climate targets without nuclear energy. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, we got a re- we got a plant restart in Michigan. We got the first nuclear reactor in Georgia. I think you're going to see a lot of stuff come out about small modular reactors. A lot of companies are getting funded in this space, which, I mean, you think about a nuclear startup getting funded, that would have been bonkers to think about 10 years ago, and it's happening now. So it's exciting. Stephen, let's talk a little bit about the balancing of two things that are needed to get nuclear adoption accelerated. One is what you've described in great detail, which is on the construction side, it's the demand side, it's the government stimulus side of it, and it's the acknowledgement that there perhaps needs to be more from a policy perspective, nuclear energy in the mix, you know, depending on who you speak to. There's also the actual supply side, right, and the supply chain piece of this. So talk us through uranium, right? This source, this is, is such a key part of the ramping story. Is there sufficient supply of uranium to achieve the goals in a price effective way that you've been talking about? Yeah, so we've been investors in, in uranium since 2018, and, uh, and back then the story was a little bit more muddy. We were kind of hoping that more plants would not be shut down. There was not really this nuclear renaissance going on. But yeah, just, just to, to level set for everyone, uranium is the fuel that goes into nuclear power plants. Um, mm-hmm. And the interesting thing about it is that um, it is an incredibly small percentage of the cost of a, of, a, of a nuclear power plant. The main thing these guys are concerned about is actual supply. Can I get my hands on this? That's mm-hmm. why they have to keep at least, uh, you know, the, the nuclear power plants, the, the contractors, they have to keep at least two or three years supply, uh, you know, in, in the background, just in case something goes wrong. So where is it coming from, Stephen? Where are the biggest deposits of uranium geographically situated? Back to the geo, geopolitics, right? Yeah. Russia and Russia and Kazakhstan, and actually France, I think, was getting fifty percent of its of its uh, uranium from Niger, and that's that's mm-hmm. now offline. So when you when you look at where the uranium is produced in the world today, it's mostly in what we call unfriendly countries, right? Countries that maybe uh, the Western uh, countries aren't on the best terms with right now, which again poses an incredible 
opportunity because really for the last 20 years it's been it's been a 15 year bloodbath in the uranium market because the russians were dumping uranium on the market the kazakhs were dumping uranium on the market they were just pumping this stuff out without caring now the largest suppliers of uranium in the world those guys are are mostly offline um so the market's in a the market's in a different place now than it has been but why do you think that's an opportunity? If we want to go back, you know, what you've been advocating for throughout this conversation is greater adoption of nuclear energy. But at the same time, we're seeing a moment where the biggest sources of fuel, the uranium to do that, would be, you know, subject to serious ge- geopolitical constraints. So uh, is this not going to throw a wrench into the appetite to take up nuclear energy? Why go and invest in the building out a bunch of nuclear energy infrastructure if you're potentially having, you know, the core engine, the uranium, can be held hostage by geopolitical forces. So luckily, Anne, North America actually has incredible amount of reserves of uranium. You bury the uranium. lead, Stephen. That's <laughs> the lead. Sure. Uh, look, uh, you, you, the, yeah, North America has incredible uh, amount of resources here. I mean, the second largest producer of uranium in the world, Cameco, uh, up, in, up in Canada, um, it has the, the greatest uranium deposits um, in the world. So where the opportunity lies on is that for the past 15, 20 years, these foreign countries have been dumping uranium on the market. Now, you could say a lot of that is offline. And really, any power plant in the Western world is going to want to go to producers in friendly, friendly countries, let's call them, Canada, uh, uh, America. So that is really the big, big opportunity here mm-hmm. because supply is, supply is, is, is shrinking. A, a ton of supply is going off the market at the same time uh, demand is ramping up. Uranium uh, pricing up, I think, Stephen, about 400% over the last couple of years, reflecting that supply side constraint that you've talked about. Stephen, we appreciate you sharing all of your thoughts. Where can, where can the audience find you to read some more and get some follow up? Yeah, so I write a daily uh, letter on all things technology from nuclear to AI to, to chips at riskhedge.com. Love people to check out me work and happy to talk anytime. Stephen McBride, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. That's it, folks. Come back to Leading Indicator with some of the finest minds on the big macro issues.